So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about the mathematics involved in our current uh, form of encryption. So the basic idea is you, have, you publish two numbers, and these are what are known as your public key. And it's akin to what I discussed in the first video. So in the first video, I said, you know, you can go to the post office and you can get a Patrick JMT padlock. Well, this is like your public key. Anybody can look up your public key. And people use these two numbers to then encrypt a message. And the magic is, again, this is the magic, that even though those two numbers are public, the only person that, that can decrypt those messages are the intended recipient. And you might think, well, geez, you know, those two numbers are public and that's what it hinges on. Isn't it possible to use those to, to sort of hack into those numbers and figure out what the message says? And again, that's the magic. That's the really cool part. It turns out, you know, the, the numbers that are public, the one that's going to be really important, it's going to be a large number. So in my uh, upcoming uh, demonstration, I'm going to show you how it actually works. I'm going to pick some small numbers just to make the mathematics a little more manageable. In reality, we use gargantuan numbers, and this is the point. These numbers, you, the, the, one of the numbers you use, the, the fact that it's useful is you take two prime numbers and multiply them together to get that number. And to be able to decrypt the message, you need to know what two numbers it came from. So you might think, well, geez, I've got this number, certainly I can factor it and find those two factors. But this is the problem, and this has been something that's been open for thousands of years. It turns out that factoring is actually a really hard problem. A lot of mathematicians are of the opinion that it's going to be, it's just something that, there's not a good solution to it. Well, it turns out that there's actually something known as Shor's algorithm. But Shor's algorithm, uh, it provides a, a fast way of factoring. But the problem is, and this is the catch, you need what's known as a quantum computer. We don't have quantum computers yet. I was reading something the other day, I think we're getting close to maybe having something viable. And if quantum computers do come into existence, this current form of encryption will no longer work. So you may think, oh no, what's happened? Fortunately, people are already working on algorithms, post-quantum algorithms. So even if quantum computers do come into effect, there's, there's a backup contingency plan for encryption. So, Okay, so you can't factor these numbers, and again, that's the, easily, that's the magic, but to, to, to actually encode a message, that was the difficult part. So mathematically, they had to come up with a function, and we now call these one-way functions. And so if you want to think about, you know, an example of a two-way function, a two-way function would be something like doubling a number, right? That's easy to undo. So the idea of a, of a, of a two-way function is that it's easy to undo, right? So if I double a number, hey, I divide it by two, I'm back where I started. No problem. That's a simple example. The one-way function we're going to use is based on modular arithmetic. And I'm going to briefly talk about modular arithmetic in, the, in, in my demonstration. And again, you know, it, it might be new for some of you. It's nothing super complicated. And we'll do a couple quick examples just so you can get a feel of it. So mathematicians tried to find this good one-way function for, for a long time. And everything they, they found, it was always basically possible to work backwards and figure out what the original message was. But eventually, people came up with this idea of using modular arithmetic to come up with a good one-way function. And in real life, a simple one-way function, just to give you an example, is that of cracking an egg, right? If I, if I take an egg, I like to cook, so I'm going to use this egg later. Um, that's a simple example of a one-way function, right? Because I, I can, I can, it's easy to crack, but it's impossible to now take this egg and restore it back to its previous state. So this is an example of a real-life one-way function. And for that reason, one-way functions mathematically are oftentimes called Humpty Dumpty functions, right? Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, they couldn't put him back together. So the same idea applies there. So let's jump in and let's look at some of the mathematics. Again, keep in mind, I'm going to pick some small numbers to make the math manageable. In real life, um, these numbers are gargantuan, and that's the magic. So we've got these really huge numbers we can work with, and it's just simply hard to factor those numbers. And that's really everything, that, that's the underpinnings of, of the current encryption that we use. Okay, let's turn our attention to the mathematics now because to me, that's the interesting part. So again, we'll review some things as we go. So to start off with, we pick, we start off picking two prime numbers. So I'm gonna pick two prime numbers. I'm gonna call them the first one P and I'm gonna let P be equal to 11. And I'm gonna pick another prime number. I'm just gonna call that one Q 
but I'm going to let that be equal to 17. So again, in practice, these two numbers are huge, 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 but again, we're taking small numbers here. So the next thing I'm going to do is I multiply those two numbers together. So P multiplied by Q, that's going to be 11 multiplied by 17, and when you multiply 11 and 17, you get the number 187, and we're going to label this as your number N. Now, we're going to pick another number as well. Okay, so we've got N equals 187. I'm going to pick another number, E. And the number that I'm going to pick here for E is I'm going to use the number 7. Now, there's one requirement here, and the requirement... So there's going to be a requirement that when we take P minus 1 and multiply that by Q minus 1, which in this case, well, P minus 1, since P is equal to 11, P minus 1 would be equal to 10. Q minus 1, well, 17 minus 1 would be 16. We would have 10 times 16, which is 160. This number, 160, this number, 160, and this number, E, have to be what's known as relatively prime. And all relatively prime means is they don't share a factor. So for example, 15 and 18 are not relatively prime because they both share a factor of 3. 15 and 16, though, are both relatively prime because the only factor, I should say, you know, the only factor they share is 1. So 15 and 16 would be considered relatively prime because the factors of 15 other than 1 are 3, 5, and 15. The factors of 16 other than 1 are what? 2, uh, 4, 2, 4, 8, and 16. So 15 and 16 would be relatively prime. And you can check, well, E itself is a prime number, and 160 does not have a factor of 7. So these two numbers are relatively prime, so we're in business. So that's one requirement that we're going to need. So our encryption method... or our en encryption formula, we use the following formula. We take... So C is going to denote the ciphertext. So this is going to be the ciphertext. And the ciphertext is basically the encrypted, the encrypted message that we send to another party. So eventually this is what's going to get sent over the internet, the ciphertext. So we use the formula M raised to the power of E. So that's this E here. We'll talk about M here in just a second. And that's going to be mod N. So this is where our modular arithmetic comes into it. And again, we'll talk about that in just a second as well. So M is going to be the message that we want to send. So the message to be sent. Now, of course, since we're using computers, everything gets turned into binary, zeros and ones, but that actually gets converted into something known as decimal. And that decimal version is what gets sent. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Let's talk about modular arithmetic. So modular arithmetic, it basically takes a number and it finds a number that's equivalent to it. And the number that's equivalent to it has to do with its remainder. So for example, if I wanted to take, um, let's say, uh, just a random example here. Uh, let's say 17 is equivalent to what? We'll say mod 3. So I want to know 17 is equivalent to what number? Mod 3. Well, what I can do is I can do long division. So 17 divided by 3. Well, 3 will go into 17 5 times. 5 multiplied by 3 is 15. We subtract, we get 2. That's the remainder. That's what it is equivalent to. So we could say that 17 is equivalent to the number 2 mod 3. So 17 is equivalent to 2 mod 3. And we actually use modular arithmetic all the time. Every day you use, I bet you, you use modular arithmetic. So if it's 10 a.m. right now, 10 a.m., and I say, what time is it going to be five hours from now? 
Well, you don't say 10 plus five, you don't say it's gonna be 15 o'clock, right? You say it's gonna be, oh, it's gonna be three o'clock. What you're really doing when you do time is you're thinking about mod 12. So 15, I'm really doing that modulo 12. Let's see, so 15 divided by 12 would leave a remainder of three. So that's a common example of modular arithmetic that we do every day. You're basically just doing long division and you're thinking, what's the remainder, okay? So, M is gonna be the message that we wanna send. So suppose we just wanna send a very simple message. Suppose the message I wanna send, so suppose I just wanna send the single letter P for yours truly. Well, you can look up this number in binary, I forget what it is, but in decimal, in decimal, the number P is represented by the number 80. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm gonna send. I wanna send um, this number 80 via the internet. So, okay, so now I use my formula here. So, C is gonna be equal to the message, which is the number 80. I raise that to the power of E, which is seven. So, 80 to the seventh, that's a pretty big number. And then I have to do that modulo, so mod or modulo, the number N, and my number N here is 187. So there are ways to, to do this. You know, a computer can do this. I actually put this either, I think I put this in Google or Wolfram Alpha. You can use that one as well. There's a way to do it, to do it a little bit shorter by hand. I'm not gonna talk about that. But if you take 80 and raise it to the seventh power and then you were to do long division with 187, it turns out that that number is gonna be equal to, it's gonna be equivalent to the number 75 mod 187. So if I take 80 to the seventh, divide it by 187, do all the long division, I'm gonna find that rem my remainder when I'm done is gonna be 75. That is gonna be the ciphertext. So that's what gets sent. So we send, we send this number 75 on the internet. Okay, so what happens now? So what we do now is we calculate something new. We have to calculate, we take our number E and we multiply that by some number D. And this number D is gonna be the decryption key. So this is gonna be our decryption key. And we want E multiplied by D to be equivalent to the number one. When we do mod, we take P minus one times Q minus one. Okay, so we said that the number E, we already picked that, that's the number seven. So I have to take seven and multiply that by D and have that be equivalent to the number one modulo, well, P minus one times Q minus one, we just computed that over here, that was the number 160. And the reason why you want these numbers to be relatively prime, otherwise some funky stuff can happen at this step. That's the reason why this needs to be relatively prime. So I have to pick seven multiplied by what number? I've got to do long division. I've got to divide in this case by 160 and I have to get a remainder of one. I have to figure out this number D. Now you think, well, I don't know how to do this. It turns out there's something called the Euclidean algorithm that actually enables you to find this relatively quickly. So again, I'm gonna leave those steps out. Um, if you're interested, let me know, we can talk about it. So it turns out that to get this number D, it turns out that this number D is equal to the number 23. So if you take seven and multiply it by the number 23, you'll get a new number. Divide that by the number 160, you're gonna find out that you have a remainder of one at the end. Okay, and this is the decryption key. This is important. And the only reason why you're able to figure out this number is because you've kept P and Q private. Nobody knows those numbers. So to work out this step is super, super difficult. The only way to solve it, we know right now, is to use brute force. So the only way to get this decryption number D is by already knowing these two numbers, P and Q. And again, these are your private keys. Your private keys. These numbers, uh, 187 and, and seven, the numbers N and E, those are your public key. So anybody, again, think about like a telephone directory. Anybody can look up the public key, these two numbers. 
They see 187. Again, intuitively, the idea is that these are going to be really large in practice so that people don't know what P and Q are. Those are your private keys. And this is where we get the terminology public and private key. So, okay, we get this number uh, D equals 23. So now to decrypt, so now to decrypt the message, to decrypt, we use the following formula. We want to get the original number, the original number M, which was the original message. Okay, so M is going to be the message to be sent. We sent the letter P. So M, to get the original message sent, we're going to take the ciphertext C, we're going to raise that to the power of D, and again, we take it, in this case, we do mod the original value of M, which was 187. Okay, so I'm trying to recover this original number M. C was the ciphertext. That's what we received, this number 75. And again, maybe somebody intercepted it and they saw that the the number 75 was sent. But without knowing this value of D, you're in big trouble. So 75 raised to the power of 20, excuse me, 75 raised to the power of 20, (laughs) 75 raised to the power of 23, mod 187. Again, you know, you wouldn't want to do this by hand. There are ways to break it down and do it by a calculator. Again, I think I put this into into Wolfram. So if you compute this, um, m equal to 75 raised to the power of 23 mod 187, you get, lo and behold, you get the number 80. Ta-da! And the number 80 was the original uh, number that we sent. And again, the number 80 now corresponds to the letter P. So that's how this encryption method works. And this is known as RSA encryption after it's the the, the first initials of the last names of the people that came up with it. So that's the basic idea. And again, it's super difficult to, to find this number D, this decryption key, without knowing P and Q, and again, That's the brilliance and that's the magic. So in our example, again, we picked small values for P and Q to make the math manageable. In actual practice, the values for P and Q and therefore the resulting value for N can be ginormous. So for example, in really important banking transactions, N can be larger than 10 raised to the 300 power. And 10 raised to the power of 300, you know, you write that down, 10 raised to the 300, it looks kind of innocuous. It's, it's hard to feel, get a feel for how big of a number that is. But that's easily, that number's easily larger than the number of atoms in the universe. It's a, by far, it's a gargantuan number. And I was reading that if you take even, you know, a hundred million personal computers all working together, it would still take over a thousand years to crack one of these codes. So again, from a brute uh, brute force perspective, it's simply, uh, these codes are perfect for our everyday use and function, which I think is really cool. So, you know, again, this this issue of key distribution had been central to cryptogra- cryptography forever. It's hard to sort of overstate the, the importance of it. It was one of the central concerns of having a good uh, a good system. And these people through some, you know, I, I'm going to say relatively simple, you know, it deals with prime numbers and factoring and modular arithmetic uh, with some relatively simple mathematics, but the way that it was all put together was just absolutely brilliant. I mean, just brilliant, the, the mark of genius, the way that they did this. So I think it's great. And again, you know, it's things that we take for granted, but the way that we use the internet now, it wouldn't be possible without some of this mathematics. And I think that is really cool. And that's part of the reason why I love math, because you know, there's all these things going on behind the scene that we all, a lot of times don't really see or think about that make a lot of things that we use on a day-to-day basis useful and, 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 and possible. So that's why I love math. I think it's great. So once again, a big shout out to the making and science team at Google. They made this video possible. If you like this video, please thumbs up it, share it, you know, Facebook, Twitter with the hashtag science goals and stay tuned. I love making these types of videos and I, I like my technical ones as well, but these are fun too. So stay tuned for more of these as I'm going to keep making them. Thanks.